This is going to be a, di a, a difficult talk to follow up, but uh, from Terras, I mean, so uh, it was a great job that he did, but yeah, let's learn about testing. So, how many of you have used the React testing library? Okay, cool. So, my talk will pretty much touch a bit on, on that focus, but before anything else, let me introduce myself. My name is Daniel Ophos. I'm working as a developer advocate as, at OLX Group. Uh, I'm an Altero ambassador, and I'm an AGED uh, instructor. You can find me on Twitter and any, pretty much any social network at the end of Daniel J.C. Um And yeah, in the main ecosystem and stuff that I've been interested in the last couple of years, it's been React, uh, JavaScript, and the testing library. So let's start about your, uh, your agenda for this talk, what it is about. So this talk tells a story about the migration to React hooks that show us that our tests were not being done the way we wanted them to do it. In this process, we got to know the React testing library and did the migration from Enzyme to the React testing library. So yeah, so after, the, after this, I'll be pretty much showing you a guide of everything that, well, in my perspective, you need for using the React testing library and some of the common issues that I found in the last couple of years of using it. So let's start with some context. We were in 2019 and we had a fairly new React re uh, Redux project. Uh, the project was around four months at that time, and hooks came around. And, well, at our team, we said, let's migrate to React hooks. Let's just do it. Uh, they are feeling stable. We have a bunch of uh, reasons to use them, like there was more code readability. Uh, everything since the introduction of use effects made us easier to write and gr group the logic together. After um, that, we have much more code readability because with the introduction of, of hooks, now we have a stateful way to share state. And at a team I was working at the time, we would be soon onboarding some new junior developers. So we wanted them, their experience to be much more easier about learning React. And from our perspective, through hooks, we took a lot of uh, complexity out of it. So yeah, we started working. You can see us here furiously typing and migrating our code base to starting using hooks. Well, the migration was successful, at least from our perspective. Everything seemed to be working OK. We had much less lines of code than previously. Um, and yeah, everything was cool. Until someone remembered, hey, have you checked our tests? And yeah, this was what happened. Almost half of the lines of the tests that we had were failing. So you could probably imagine that this was our reaction at the time. We were left to wonder what's happening. This is not working. The tests are not working, but the implementation changed okay, but the way that the user interacts with the stuff, it's the same. Everything seems to be the same, so what happened to our tests? And we did some research, and we came to the conclusion that there was only one guilty party in here, and that guilty party was testing implementation details. Now you might wonder, what are implementation details? Well, as someone that's around this conference somewhere, uh, can see dot set, implementation details are the things which users of your code will not typically use see or even know about. And putting this in perspective, implementation details can be things like, well, the component state, the props that we were sending to our components. And yeah, our tests were filled with these things. We, our tests were tied to our uh, state. We were not focusing on the user, to be honest. So yeah, from this process, we started to figure out a new way to handle this, to make it better, a better experience for development. And it was pretty clear to us, very straightforward, that we had to get out of Enzyme and start using the React testing library. Now, don't get me wrong, Enzyme is super great. It's a great tool, it's super powerful. The thing is, if you don't use it in the right way, to be honest, it might give you some issues. So here are a couple of examples of things that I personally, personally don't like by using Enzyme. First things first is shallow rendering. So for those of you who don't know, Shallow rendering are the way that we can render uh, our tests, but only with the shallow part. What I mean by this is, if our component doesn't have any children, they, uh, that does have F children, they won't be rendered. And by doing this, by rendering only the shallow part of our component, we are not testing our stuff the same way that our user interacts with our components. 
The second thing is find. So find, it's the way that Enzyme offers you to create the DOM for stuff. The thing is, find, it's super great, but it also allows you to test and search for stuff using your component name. Well, a component name is an implementation detail, because if this changes, then your test will break, because, well, it's not how the user works for stuff. The user doesn't care what the component name is. And then, probably the biggest implementation detail, the component state. Our tests at that time were deeply, deeply tied to state. This, was, this is a simple example, but this is an, an experience of stuff we had. Our tests were tied to the component state. We were checking and asserting if the component state were X or Y. And putting this in perspective, the user, once again, doesn't care what the component state is. The user cares if he clicks on a button, something pops up, or if something. It doesn't care about the state. So yeah, we did our migration. We got out of Enzyme, and we started using React Testing Library uh, from the Testing Library family. And with it comes its main guideline, which is the more your tests resemble the way your software is used, the more confidence they can give you. So once again, this is a quote by Ken Sidot, who he actually is a creator of the testing library. So thanks to him for making our, our lives much easier by creating this. Um, so strap on, because now we are going to get pretty much a guide of everything that you need to write your tests. So this might seem like a simple example, and it's very simple, but this is how a test can be normally structured. First things first, we have a ran we destructure the stuff that we need, and we describe our tests. Then we do a couple of things. First things first, we render the component that we want to use. In this scenario, we are using the render function and passing it my component. Then, once we render it, we need to find a way to query the DOM for stuff. So what we do is we destructure, destructure our query. In this scenario, we are getting a, a query called get by um, variant with, with the label change. Then we do our query. In this scenario, we are trying to find a label that has the text a label. And afterwards, we do some action. We, we do an event firing. We are firing an, a change event. In this scenario, we are firing uh, an event to change the, test, the text of our input. Then we do our, asser our assertion. This is uh, pretty much following the pattern of the AAA. Um, so arrange, um, act, and assert. So let's get a bit more deep into this type of things. So let's start by render. Render is a function that will pick up your component, render it into a container, um, and this container will afterwards be appended to a document body. Besides doing this, um, this function also gives you a couple of utilities. It gives you the container um, where your component was rendered. It gives you a debug function that uh, you can use to check the state uh, of how your component works and gives you functions like unmount to trigger unmount events and re-render to trigger re-render events. And yeah, this is pretty much the first step that you're probably going to do when writing a test, which is rendering your component. Then often afterwards, we need to do some querying. We need to search for stuff on the DOM. So queries work in this way in the React testing library. All queries have a variant, and then afterwards they are appended by something. So there are three types of variants in the testing library ecosystem. We have the query by, the get by, and the find by. So the query by, it's a query that will find the first matching node that you're looking for. But if it doesn't find it, it will return no. So you look for something. If it doesn't exist, no problem. It returns no. Then we have the get by query, which works much like, like the query by, with the exception if, if it doesn't find the first matching node you're looking, it will throw an error. So just to recap, query by will return null, get by will return, it will throw an error when it doesn't find what you're looking for. And all these queries are synchronous, so you don't need to wait for them. But if for some reason you need to wait for something, something that might pop up, you can use the find by variant. So this find by, find by, uh, find by variant <laughs> will return a promise that will resolve um, when it finds what you're looking for. If it doesn't, then it will reject it. So like I said, all these variants will only return you the first matching node. If for some reason you want to get an array of all the things you're looking for, then you can use uh, an all by variant. So the process will be query all by, get all by, and find all by. This will pretty much return you an array with all the stuff that you're looking for. So these are the variants, but these variants are appended with something 
that uh, belong to the query family. So now one question that I often hear is, OK, but Daniel, what query should I use? What's the variant I should pick up? What, 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 how should I query pretty much? So my answer and the recommended approach is you should always focus on queries that mostly reflect the user experience. So here we have the query family. So we have the queries that are accessible to everyone, which are pretty much the queries that mostly reflect the experience of all users. Then we have semantic queries, test ID queries, which start to reflect some implementation details, but it's a controlled one. And then our escape edge, which are manual queries, and you should probably never use them, uh, but I'll show them uh, either way so you're aware. So let's start by the queries accessible to everyone. Like I said, these are the queries that mostly reflect the experience of visual, um, mouse, and assistive technology users. So how would you use this query? Pretty much, you get your variant, and then you append it either by label text, by placeholder test, by role, by display value, or by text. This will pretty much find the stuff you're looking for following this criteria. And then we have the semantic queries, which should be your second option. So these are queries that make use of HTML5 and area compliance selectors, but in certain cases don't fully res uh, respect the accessibility type of things. So the queries that belong to this family are the by alt text and the by title. So let's look at some examples. Here we have an example of a query that's accessible to everyone. In this scenario, we have a label um, and we have an input. Our input is assigned to, um, to our label by using the area labeled by. And how would we go to, to get this input from querying? So first things first, we need to render our component. After your component is rendered, what you do is you destructure your query. So in this scenario, we are getting a get by variant, which will return the first node, or throw a what if it doesn't find it, and the label text, which belongs to the queries accessible to everyone. So how do you do it? You pretty much say, I want to get by label text the username. So this will look into your DOM. It will find where the username is. It will find, is this label assigned to anything? And it will see, OK, it's assigned to our input through the area labeled by attribute. And yeah, this is pretty much an example of how to using a query accessible to everyone. So speaking of semantic queries, um, here we have an example of using the title attribute. Uh, in this scenario, we have a span which has the title uh, delete. And the process is very similar. We render our component, we get our variant and family. In this scenario, get by title. And we call our query. In this scenario, the query will pick up on the DOM attribute, which, is, which has the attribute title. In this scenario, it will find this span and return it so you can do anything with it. Um, like I said, semantic queries don't fully uh, respect uh, accessibility patterns. For instance, as the, um, the title attribute is not consistently read in screen readers. So this is why you should only pick up these queries as a second option. Well, if for some reason none of these queries work, then you can resort to these ones. But as a last resort, I guess. So the first one is the test IDs. Pretty much what this happens is you attribute the test ID to your component, and you can query by it. So you can query or get find by test ID. This is an implementation detail, but it's a controlled one. So it makes sure that, well, in scenarios that you have to focus on an implementation detail, at least you have something that you can control. If for some reason, and this, I only had to use this like one time in over four years of using the testing library, uh, none of these queries work, then you can follow up with a manual query. This is actually not a query belonging to the um, testing library. It's actually the query selector DOM API. So looking at examples, the process is very simple. Again, we have our div with our data test ID attributed. Um, now, you might ask, OK, but what scenarios should we use test IDs? Well, let's imagine that the content of this div is always changing, and you have no way to find it. Well, in this scenario, you can assign it a test ID. The process is very simple. You render a component, you destructure the query, get by test ID, and you query the DOM for it. And yeah, this is pretty much the process like other queries. For manual queries, it doesn't work quite the same, because like I said, this is not a query for the React testing library. What you have to do in this scenario is you have to destructure the container that you get from the render. Remember, I told you that the component, when it renders, it renders on a container. You have to get access to that container and pretty much just call the query selector API. So in this scenario, we call the container.querySelector and we pass the selector of the stuff we are looking for. Like I said, this is an escape patch, so use it carefully because once again, this teaches 
or focuses on um, on an implementation details pattern, and this is not what the testing library encourages you to do. If for some reason none of these queries work, you can also try and create your own queries. I'm not going to review all this code because we'll stay here until tomorrow. But pretty much what we want to do in here is create your own queries um, that fit your needs. So in this scenario, we have a query for testing using uh, I18 tra translations. So you can do this by using the build queries helper. It's important that if you decide to follow this approach and build your own queries, you do so in a way that focuses, once again, on the user implementation perspective and not on the implementation details. So yeah, we've seen rendering, we've seen querying. Now we can start by going into actions and performing stuff. So there are two ways of firing events in the testing library ecosystem. One is by using the fire event, which act actually um, comes with the testing library by itself, or by using um, a, um, a parallel or a, a library that, come, that you can install as well called the user event library. So what's the difference, you might ask? Fire event will do only one thing, which is fire a single event. Now, once again, that's not the experience of how the user interacts with your components. What the user does, for instance, is when clicking on a button, it puts his mouse over the button, he clicks it, and probably will do something else. So there are a couple events that are associated with this. So mouse over, mouse down, all these events are things that the user focuses on. So user event library was created so that you can fo uh, focus and do exactly the same events that the user does when interacting with a component. The process is pretty much the same for both of them. You either, for fire event, you call fire event, you say the event that you want to do, and you pass it the, um, the node where you want to do that event. In this scenario, we're firing a click on a button uh, which has the, um, the name save associated to it. With the user library, the process is the same. You click, you, you specify where you want to click. One thing that it's important to mention, and some of you might wonder where is there an await here. So since the latest release of the user event library, all the events started being asynchronous. So before they were not. So if you are on, out on the internet and starting seeing examples with await or without await, it's important to check what is the version of the uh, user event library you're using. So yeah, we know how to fire events, you know how to render, you know how to query, pretty much we have all the things that you might need. But let's picture um, a scenario that you need to await for something. Let's, for instance, as you click on a button and you need to await for um, a model, something to show up, or a progress bar. To do this, we can use the wait for um, utilities. This is pretty much a function. That's asynchronous, so you have to wait for it. And pretty much what it does is it will await for whatever it's inside of it. So in this scenario, we are passing it an assertion. And pretty much what it will do is it will loop the code inside until this assertion passes. Uh, this has a, uh, a defined time, so it, if it doesn't pass over a certain time, it will throw an error. In the first scenario, you want to wait for something to disappear from the DOM. You can use wait for element to be re removed, which is, can work the same way as wait for but it's more useful because all you have to do is pass it to your component and it pretty much will wait until that component disappears from the DOM. And yeah, pretty much, we are pretty much done. Um, let's just review some helpers that can, use, can, you, can help you in your day today. The first one is within. So imagine for some reason you want to perform a query only inside of a specific component that you queried before. So you might have a div and you want to query only inside of that div. Within is pretty much um, a function that you can use. Pass it the component you want to perform your query inside, and then perform your query. Here we can see that we are getting our input node by using the get by test ID uh, query. Doing within that input node, I want to query to get by text some text. And screen. Screen is super helpful. Why? Because it gives you the ability and takes the, the need to destructure queries from render. So screen pretty much has um, uh, an attachment to the container. So everything that you can use with screen, it's like you would be destructuring from render. So instead of doing that, as you can see in the example below, we render a component and we say uh, screen.getByTestID and the query will be pretty much the same process. The final helper, uh, it's debug. So debug just allows you to see the, the um, the current aspect of your component. You can destructure it from render. You can use it with screen. 
Uh, if you don't pass any parameters to it, it will show the entire state of your, um, of your DOM. If you pass it a component or an array of components, it will show the current state, the current way it works of those components. So, yeah, uh, we used, I've been using the testing library for around four, four years by now. I'm super happy with it. Like the, te the tests are right, can survive any, well, non-feature altering refactor because, well, the user experience becomes the same, continues to be the same, and yeah, it's super, super great. I really like it. So I like to thank Ken for creating it. Uh, before wrapping up this talk, there are just a couple of things that I want to show you, which are mistakes I've seen around these these years. Um, so let's start with the first one: using ACT. So for those of you who don't know. Uh, when performing uh, interactions with the user interface, there are things that are called units of interaction with the user interface. This can be things like rendering a component, firing an, um, firing an event, or clicking on something. And pretty much ACT is an util that React created so that it can make sure that all your actions are deployed to the DOM before you proceed. So putting that in perspective, it might make sense. OK, let's wrap or render with ACT. Let's wrap or firing events with ACT. The thing is, we don't need it. Why? Because the React testing library automatically wraps everything that's going to be doing a unit of interaction with the UI uh, with ACT by itself. Using get by, we expect not to be in a document. So like I said, get by is a query that will throw an error when it doesn't find what it's looking for. And expect not to be in a document is pretty much um, an assertion that just DOM exports that will make sure that the thing you're looking for doesn't exist on the, on the DOM. So if you're trying to query for something, that will throw an error that when doesn't exist, so this test will always fail. So in this scenario, what you should use, it's a query by variant, because if it doesn't find what it's looking for, it will return no. Another error, um, using wait with fire event or non-asynchronous queries. So I've seen some patterns like this, like waiting for um, a get by variant to be found, waiting for a firing event to be triggered. Thing is, we don't need these types of things because all these types of things are synchronous. So instead, just remove the wait and only use the wait if you're using a find by variant for the queries or um, an asynchronous util. Using wait, a wait with wait for with an empty callback inside. So it's pretty much this thing that we can see in here. Um, now, you might be wondering, why would I wait for something that's just an empty callback. Well, I've seen this pattern to deal with an issue that I'll show you right after this section. But it's pretty much what this will do, it's, it will wait for the next tick of your test. And once it's finished, then it will proceed to your assertion. The thing is, while this might work sometimes, it doesn't guarantee it to you that when you get your, to the part of expect, your test will pass. So instead, what you should do, it's pass your assertion to inside of wait for. And it will loop the assertion until it evaluates to true and that the test passes. Using cleanup. So cleanup is pretty much a function that will clean up your, your DOM, your container, after your test ends or whenever you want it. The thing is, OK, it might make sense. So I want to, after each of each my test, I want to run cleanup just to make sure everything is clean and OK. Well, the thing is, if we are using a framework that supports the after each global, like Jest, you don't need to do this because the React Testing Library will run this automatically for you. So thanks for that. Uh, using a wait for with synchronous queries. So I've seen this pattern quite a long time. So pretty much what people do here is pass the get by variant inside of a wait for. Well, it's not necessary because we have a find by variant that you can await and you don't need to make your code more unreadable than it already it is in certain cases using side effects inside of wait for. So this is something that I've seen people do like, well, I click on a button, then I try to make an assertion, and for some reason the assertion didn't pass. Let's just put my clicking inside of the, the assertion. Well, it's not necessary, and this might be even more uh, bad for you in this scenario, because pretty much, like I said, wait for will loop the code inside of it. So this does not guarantee it that first things first, your assertion is going to pass, and it might also do more harm because you're triggering the, triggering the user event uh, quick in this scenario, your side effect, every time it whoops. So instead, what you should do, it's, um, oops, I came up. So what you should do, it's pass your user event and your action before uh, your wait for, and then 
do your session inside of the wait form. And yeah, with all these mistakes, here's a thing that really helped catch some of them. Uh, the SWIND plugin for testing library has pretty much most of these use cases there, so it can warn you when you're doing something that you shouldn't. Um, and before wrapping up my talk, so we have in the last five minutes, so this is pretty much the most common error that I've seen while using the React testing library. And it's probably the most Googled one, which is warning an update to your app inside the test was not wrapped in act. So you might be wondering, why is this error? You did, didn't you just say you probably don't never need to use act? Yes, I did. But let's look at an example. So we have this function here, which is a component that has a, um, it's called display Pokemon. This component will get a function uh, for querying the, for querying, for doing a fetch request in this scenario, getting our Pokemon data. We have a use state hook, which has loading and set loading, and when we have a function um, that will do a couple of things. First things first, it will set loading as true whenever you first call it. Then it will try and get your data by calling get Pokemon data with the Pokemon name that you pass it. Then, whenever you, that data comes back, it will set loading as false. Uh, or if there's an error, it will set loading as false. Then what we do, we have a button that whenever we click on it, uh, it's gonna call this function with the name Pikachu. And then we show our loading state. Now, how might we test for this? Well, this is an, an example that I probably would have written a couple of months ago or years ago. So, first things first, I describe my test. I mock my get Pokemon data function with a JSTFN, and then I render my component and pass it um, my mocked function as the get Pokemon parameter. Okay, then what I do, I await for um, a user click event. I click on the button that has the name Pikachu, so I'm using a, a get by row query, which will look for a button in this scenario with the name Pikachu on it. I click on it, and then I do some assertions, and then I assert, I expect my get Pokemon data to be called with Pikachu. Okay, so this is an assertion. The thing is, if I run this test, tada, it is the dreaded error that none of us like. An update to display Pokemon inside of a test was not wrapped in act. So this error comes up because, like I said, it's expected when you're writing a test that all the actions and all the things that are called units of interaction with the user interface are flushed out to the DOM. So this error pretty much is telling us, hey, look, there's something happening after your test ends that you're not looking for. There's an error there. There's an action that you're not contemplating on your test. So first things first, I want to thank React for thinking of that and letting us know, hey, look, something is wrong there. Now, putting this in perspective, can anyone try to guess what might be the thing we are forgetting in our test? OK. So, it's this, pretty much, which is the set is loading. So for some reason, we are clicking on a button. We are asserting that the call was done. But we are forgetting that we are setting loading as false. So there's a state update that's being triggered after our test ends. And pretty much this error is React way of telling us, you're not testing everything. You forgot some scenario. So how do we fix this? By doing the following. We either await for the, the loading to disappear from the DOM because it's being rendered, or we wait for them to be removed. So we can use wait for with a query and an assertion not to be in the document, or we can wait for element to be removed. And yeah, this is pretty much the most common error with the React Testing Library, and it's important that you're aware that you probably don't need act. So if you see this error, try to think, what am I forgetting in my test? And yeah, that's my time. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel LaFons. You can follow me on Twitter, on any social media. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Daniel, for the